much. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a wonderful symposium. It's actually a very appropriate symposium for, or colloquium for this year's meetings, because the sky islands that we're talking about here outside of Tucson are also different places in the world have sky islands. And today I'm going to be talking about the islands of alpine vegetation in central Mexico. And in central Mexico, these sky islands are essentially the creme de la creme of the sky islands. So they sit on top of actually a sea of coniferous forests. Okay, so So, just a few generalizations about alpine vegetation. So it's essentially distributed throughout the world in both temperate and tropical areas. It's usually highly fragmented, so there's not huge expansions, expanses of alpine vegetation. It's characterized as occurring above tree lines, so that's one of the major features. So there's generally no not trees there. It has a very short growing season, very cold temperatures, and there's often high insulation, high winds. So these are very extreme environments. So, so they're sort of at the limit of what life can withstand. And as we saw in the previous talks, there are habitats that are extremely threatened by global warming. In Mexico, it's a very restricted habitat. So we just saw a talk where there's a few alpine areas in Baja California. There's some in the Sierra Madre Oriental. There's some in southern Mexico. There's just one peak. And what we're going to be talking about today is the alpine vegetation of central Mexico. And in central Mexico, it's restricted to the Trans-Mexican Volcanic Belt. So this is an active volcanic region that essentially stretches across the country, and it's composed of thousands and thousands of volcanic peaks, some of which are still active. And of these peaks, it's very limited. And in central Mexico, tree line occurs at about 3,700 to 4,000 meters. And tree line is usually associated with latitude, so as you get closer to the equator, it gets higher, and as you get closer to the poles, it gets lower. So it's about, you know, generally 3,900 meters. And it had a much greater distribution in the Pleistocene, and right now it's restricted to only 11 of the highest peaks in central Mexico. And it's composed of two distinct communities. So at lower elevations, you have a tussock grassland that's usually dominated by Muhlenbergia and Festuca and Carlomagrasta. So three, those three genera really dominate. And as you get higher, it becomes more of an open four metal. So other herbaceous plants become more common. And then as you get to about 4,750 meters, that's where vascular plants drop off. And you have, for a couple hundred meters, lichens and mosses. But it becomes very, you know, inhospitable. And just to show you a few of the central Mexican peaks, the highest peak in Mexico is the Pico de Orizaba. In fact, this is the third highest peak in all of continental North America. Only two peaks in Alaska are higher, so it's 5,600 feet, so about a little more than 5,600 meters, so a little more than 18,000 feet. And there's about 50 square kilometers of alpine vegetation. Probably the most famous of the alpine areas in Mexico is Popocatepetl. So this is the only alpine area that's currently has active volcanic, an active volcano. And it has about 33 square kilometers of alpine vegetation. The Nevada de Toluca is noteworthy because there's two freshwater lakes in the center of the crater, and it has about 15 square kilometers. But most of the alpine peaks are very limited in size. For example, the Nevada Colima has just about a square kilometer of alpine vegetation just on the very top. And in total, it's only about 150 square kilometers of alpine vegetation throughout these areas. So this is essentially a floristic study. So we wanted to figure out what's growing on these peaks. We wanted to look at the individual peaks and then take a whole 
synthesis of all of them together. We want to look at the growth forms, just to see how it compares with other alpine areas, identify the alpine endemics, and finally take a look at the biogeographic affinities of the central Mexican flora, because Mexico sits between the northern holarctic biome and the southern neotropical biome, so we wanted to see on these high peaks where are the affinities of the plants that occur there. So we did a lot of field work, especially from 2012 to about 2015, but we've still been going out there regularly and occasionally finding things that we didn't see before. And of course, had to examine the herbarium specimens from the pertinent herbaria, looked at literature for records, revisions, treatments that were done. And nowadays you can't ignore iNaturalist. We've seen a few things that have come in through iNaturalist that is records that were also overlooked. And in total, we looked at about 3,500 records from these peaks. And the vascular plant diversity is not super high, but it's kind of comparable to other alpine regions. So you have about 236 species of vascular plants. And there are some ferns, there are a few conifers, but as would be expected, angiosperms really dominate the flora. And in particular, there's three families that really do well up there. So... Asteraceae, they seem to do well just about everywhere. So there's about 44 species of comps in the region. And the grasses also do pretty well, so there's about 42 species that we've encountered. And the other third most diverse family is Caryophyllaceae, with about 20 species. And together, these three families account for almost half of the diversity that occurs in these alpine regions. Some of the other families that are frequent are the Crassulaceae, the Rosaceae, and the Brassicaceae, but none of these have more than 10 species. And to round out the top 10 families, you have the Sedges, Plantagenesi, and the Carrot family, each with 7 species, and the Orbancaceae with 6 species. Most of the families only have one or two species present. And if you look at the diversity in the Alpine Islands, and you look at the diversity, or these are the largest families. So the largest families for Mexico are on the right, and for the South Alpine Islands are on the left. You can see only two families are similar between them, so the Alpine floor is not really characteristic of the Mexican floor. Families are very common in Mexico. The orchids, the Cactaceae, the Euphorbiaceae, Malvaceae are not represented at all. And things like Fabaceae just have a couple of species, or in the case of the Rubiaceae, just a single species. And when you look at the diversity across the range, there's a great difference between the Naval de Colima, which has only 31 species, or about 13% of the diversity, and Ista Siwato, which has about 70% of the diversity. And another thing to note is that only 10 species are shared between all of these peaks, whereas 86 species occur on just one of the peaks. So there's a lot of beta diversity. And another thing to notice here, there's not really a direct correlation between size of the Alpine island and the diversity. There's some trends, of course, but for example, one interesting result is the Cofre de Perote, which is a very small area, about 2 square kilometers, has about 93 species. And you look at the Pico de Orizaba, this massive alpine region, and it only has approximately 80 species. So it's less diverse. And these are very close, so you can stand on one and look over and see the other one. And one of the factors that seems to be affecting the diversity in these peaks is the time since the last volcanic eruption. So Pico de Orizaba has eruptions from the documented from the 1800s, whereas the Cofre de Perote has been dormant for a much longer time. In the case of the Nevada de Colima, which is relatively small and diverse, relatively small and relatively little diversity, it's the peak that's about 500 kilometers west of the main group of peaks. So it seems to be distant from the other peaks. It seems to also have a fact, have also seems to be a factor in these because other small peaks that are closer to the main mass of alpine areas are relatively more diverse. So looking at growth form, as would be expected in an alpine area, there's not many trees. There's actually just one that occurs in the lower elevation as scattered individuals, and this is Pinus harwigii, which has the distinction of being the pine that grows to the highest 
elevations, and it occurs in central Mexico. So it gets up to about 4,400 meters as not trees at that level, but just as mostly small individuals. So there's about 15 species of shrubs, about nine species of annuals, but what really dominates are the perennial herbs. So more than 200 of the species are perennial herbs, and these results are similar to other alpine areas. There's a very short growing season, so the annuals don't really compete very well, and it's too cold at the higher, I guess, above ground levels for the trees to do well. So perennial herbs really take off. And just to show a few of the growth forms, they have the cushion plants, which are these really dense small leaf plants with short internodes and compact. There's some geophytes with uh, geophytes with the underground tubercles. There's lower sets and there's graminoids, so there are no lianas up there and there's no epiphytes up there. And a form that is missing up there too is in tropical areas, and Mexico is a tropical area, what you have is generally, I guess, a lot of tropical areas you have large rosettes and these are absent from central Mexico. So there's a couple of succulents and some aquatics. And to look at the distributional patterns, so 12 species are non-native, and these 12 species are not really invasive, so they occur in the area, but fortunately they don't really seem to be competing very much with the alpine plants. You have five endemic species, none of which are endemic to a single peak, but the Cerastium perpusiae is known from just two peaks. And some of the other ones are more widespread, like Drava navicula. Then you have quasi-endemic species. So these are on these high peaks, but just get down a little bit into the upper limit of the forest, so they're not strictly alpine endemics. And whenever you look at Mexican endemics, so of the flora that we encountered, about 80 species are endemic to Mexico. And if you look at species shared between Mexico and North America, there's about 11 species, but when you, so these are things that reach their southern limits in Mexico, but whenever you look at things that reach their northern limit in Mexico, there's about 100 species, including Colobanthus ketensis, which is an interesting plant because it's claimed to fame as it's just one of the two species that, that's native to the Antarctic, and it's disjunct from northern central, uh, northern South America, about 2,000 miles to these peaks in central Mexico. And there's about 20 widespread species that occur both to the north and to the south of Mexico. And then, of course, there's a few that also are native to the Old World and are found on these peaks. Some of them are, again, disjunct from the north in the Rocky Mountains to central Mexico. And just as a summary, what you can see is that the affinities of the Alpine area, despite being in a the Alpine area, despite being kind of a whole Arctic and northern temperate, you know, the Finnish you seem to be much more with southern, you know, I guess South America and Central America. And just finally, I'd like to thank, uh, you know, the funding agency, Canavio, who supported our field work, the herbarium that allowed us to consult their collections, and also the natural parks that we did the work in. They were all very helpful. And thank you all for joining us.